we're talking about Paul this morning, we're just going to continue talking about Paul tonight. Okay. And so we're going to go to Acts chapter 26. Whenever you get a chance to um, talk to somebody, and uh, let's say it, it's it's somebody that uh, uh, doesn't know Christ, they're they're lost. Uh, what do you say to them? Sometimes I don't know what to say. Okay. <coughs> Other than to let them know how Christ has impacted my life and changed my life. Okay. Anybody else? Thanks, Shayla. I work with my He doesn't believe in God, but still. He said, I like you don't preach it. And you and Jonathan's another Christian who works here. Mm -hmm. I don't have to preach it you. I live Christ. Yep. And he kind of looked at me like, well, you are a little bit different. Well, I'm not that different. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, um, in, in, in Acts, this is the latter por portion of Acts. If you remember, uh, Paul has, has been arrested. And, and um, they're basically, you know, they're going, they're persecuting him, and uh, when you look at, they said, okay, you're you're Jewish, and, and so you know, we're we're, we're going to basically just you know crucify you and all this stuff. And he says, hold on a minute. He says, I I am a Roman citizen, because he he had a he had a dual citizenship. He was Jewish as well as a, a Gentile or Roman. And, and so, uh, when you look at uh, chapter 25, he, he's making an, an appeal to Caesar to say, hey, hold on a minute, you, you know, as a, Roman, as a Roman citizen, I have all rights whatsoever to have a fair trial and to be heard for this. And so, um, so they're kind of, you know, it was... When you look at it, it's, it's kind of almost like the trial of Christ. He's being pressed from one court to the next court, and back to here, and then back to here. And so finally, they, they said, okay, you're right, you, you get to get, do that. And so they sent him because uh, uh, King Agrippa was coming to where Paul was at. And, and so he was going to uh, basically he, he was kind of like the magistrate, the, the ruler, uh, you know, kind of like Pontius Pilate and, and uh, Herod were, okay, there. And so uh, now he's coming before Agrippa, and this is where we're at in chapter 26, is now he gets to speak before the king, Agrippa, and he's making, he's making his plea, okay? Um, and he, he basically starts out with Paul saying uh, in verse number one, he, he says, listen, Paul, uh, you're not permitted to speak for yourself. You can't defend yourself. Well, you, you know, where's your lawyer? Who, who, who's pleading your case for you? Who's speaking for you? And, and then Paul uh, comes back in verse 2 and says, okay, then, then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. And he says, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I'm going to make a defense before you about everything that I'm accused of by the Jews. Okay? So, I'm a Roman citizen, and the Jews are, are bringing charges against me and I'm going to speak in my own defense about those charges that, that they're bringing up about me. 
And he goes on and he says, especially, talking to King Agrippa, especially since you are an expert um, in all of the Jewish customs and controversies. So he says, therefore, he says, I, I, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So here's kind of the, 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 the whole deal about everything. He's saying, okay, I'm going to give you my testimony. I'm going to, uh, hey, Sheila. <laughs> We're in Acts chapter 26. And, and, and so he's saying, okay, so if, if I'm going to defend myself, and here are the charges, then you've got to allow me to speak for myself, to, to defend myself of these charges. And he says, and especially since, you know, you're the expert. You, you should know the Jewish customs and everything else. And so when I speak to you about those customs, then, then you should know whether I'm right or wrong, since you're the expert in all of this. Okay, so, so then what he's trying to start out, and this is, this is where we were talking about, that if you're going to share your testimony with someone, and this is what Paul starts is I'm going to talk to you about my life prior to coming to know Christ. And so this is where he, he's starting with in, in, in the verses 4, uh, actually 4 through 11. Okay, look at what he says. He says, I want you to know all, in, in uh, Acts chapter 26, verse number 4, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. So yeah, I, I was Roman, but I spent my time in Jerusalem. Okay? So this is where the, you know, the dual citizenship is coming about. Even though I'm Roman, I'm spending my time in Jerusalem. So I'm learning the Jewish customs. And then it goes on, and he says, Now they had previously known me uh, for quite some time. And if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our nation, I lived as a Pharisee. So here's what he's, he's saying. Okay, hold on. If, if you're going to accuse me of something, then you're going to have to understand that when I was a child, I lived under the strictest Jewish rules there ever was. I was a Pharisee. If you remember when Jesus talked to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the ones that um, did things like, for instance, uh, when... Um, the disciples were traveling down the road one day. It was Saturday. They were hungry. They came by a cornfield and they went out to, to uh, shuck a, an ear of corn. And the Pharisees said, hey, what, what are you letting these guys do? Don't you know that it's not right to work on the Sabbath? And they considered going into the field and harvesting a crop or even getting a, an ear of corn off of the corn stalk and eating it was work. And all they would, they would criticize for so many things. Remember what Jesus said? He said, well, hold on a minute. If you had an ox and it fell in the ditch on the Sabbath day, are you just going to let the ox stay in, 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 in the ditch? Or aren't you going to go get the ox out of the ditch? And if you can't get it out of the ditch, aren't you going to go to your neighbor and get your neighbor to help you get the ox out of the ditch? You're not going to let the, the, the ox stay in the ditch till tomorrow because it, the ox is going to die. 
He says, you wouldn't do that. And what's the difference between you going and getting the ox out of the ditch and my disciples picking the deer corn for food? And they were. Remember when um, the publican and the Pharisee went to the, went to the synagogue to pray? The publican, you know, goes to bow down. And when he goes to pray, he won't even lift up his head. The Bible says he wouldn't even lift up his head. And all he did was just kind of took his, in, in, uh, his hand to his chest, which was a, a, a sign of submission to someone in authority. And he was doing this, to, you know, and, and he said, Lord, remember me. You, you know, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. And then the Pharisee standing wouldn't even bow. And all he could do was compare himself to this low down sinner. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not like that sinner. And so the Pharisees, they had, they would take the, the, the law and, and, and to kind of remind you <coughs> of Congress. You, you know, you've got a law that says, you know, thou shalt not kill. It's was the law that Jesus or, or the God put out there. Well, they had pages and pages and pages of these things saying, this is what was called murder, the, you know, this and this and this, and, and they would break it all down and, and, and redefine it where God just said, you're not supposed to do this. And so this is what Paul is saying. To them. He says, listen, you guys are accusing me of something here. And you know my background, that I was raised as a Pharisee, which was a very strict law keeper of the law group, group of people. And he, and he continues, you know, you know, on and look at what he says, verse six. And now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise that our tribes, our 12 tribes, hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day. Because of this hope, I'm being accused by the Jews, O oh, king. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? And he's sitting here saying, here I am. I'm, I'm being put on trial for something that God has promised our forefathers. And, and if God is promising this to us, it, you know, don't you think he's going to deliver? And, and, and he says, and, and why do you think it's incredible for God to raise someone from the dead? Do you think that that's impossible to do? He's getting down to them. And they're trying to get in. But he says, he says, in fact, I myself suppose it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. This I actually did in Jerusalem. I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that uh, from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues, I often read or I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them, being greatly enraged at them. I even pursued them to foreign cities. So now he's saying, not only was I a Pharisee, man, I was a persecutor. I would follow these people who, who, who said, you, you know, I did many things in opposition to the name of Jesus, the Nazarene. He said, this is who I used to be. I was one of the meanest guys and the most, and I was one of the most feared individuals throughout all the kingdom. If I had letters for you, and you lived in Jerusalem, and you got wind that I was coming after you, and you went to another town outside of Israel and went to another foreign city, I came after you. 
I'm the bounty hunter. You, can't, you couldn't get away from me. I was going to follow you to the end of the earth, hunting you down to persecute you against Jesus the Nazarene. And he says, that's who I was. And he's beginning to tell them, you, you know, they're accusing me of some things. I need to tell you, first of all, who I was, what I was capable of doing. And then he starts at verse number 12. And he says, now, under these circumstances, I was traveling to Damascus with authority and a commission from the chief priest. Remember, I'm leading up to this. I told you I'm traveling to a foreign city. So here I am. I am on my way to Damascus. And he says, what happens? Well, at midday, while on the road, O king, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. So here I am. It is noon. And noon is when the sun is at its peak. And all of a sudden, I see this light. It's not only shining towards me, I've got this whole group with me and it's shining around them. You, you know, you ever seen those movies where uh, you, you have those uh, uh, aliens in an alien spaceship going to pick up a whole bunch of people and, and it's like they, they would always shine this big bright light down and it, it would encase all of the people. It's, it's kind of what this reminds me of. He's saying it, it wasn't an alien spaceship. But it's like, here I am, you, you know, and here's the sun and the sun's shining. But what I see radiating down is this bright light that, that's all around all of us. Not just me. Every one of us. Now look at this. He said, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, not in Greek. I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he hears his voice in Hebrew. And what does he say? But I said, who are you, Lord? And you think about it. He was raised as a Pharisee. Yet he was a Roman citizen. And out of there, he hears his voice in Hebrew. And he recognizes that voice. And sometimes when we read this, we just kind of like throw it away. Okay? It's the voice of the Lord. But you got to think about this for a minute. Here was Paul recounting his life. Now he's traveling down the road to Damascus. And there's a voice that's calling him. And he recognizes that voice. Now you think back to your conversion experience. We always talk about, you know, there's this voice. There's this urging, this yearning. Something is talking to us about our condition. That needs to be resolved and something we need to do. And the question is, did you recognize that as the Holy Spirit? Because remember what he said. He said, you cannot come to me unless the Holy Spirit be drawing you. So you've got to know 
if that's the Holy Spirit. Now you think about this for a minute. Paul had never met Jesus as Saul. We, we don't know. All we really know about Saul when we first see this is when he was traveling, you know, for, the, for persecution. And he was the young man when Stephen was being stoned that they actually, when they took off Stephen's clothes, they gave them to, to Saul to hold. So he was holding the garments of, of Stephen and watching as Stephen is being stoned. And he's, he knows that the Stephen is a, is a person who is a follower of this Jesus of Nazarene that he's persecuting people against. But when he hears that voice, he recognizes the voice. And before we can tell anybody about our conversion experience, we've got to know for a fact that we've been converted that it was the Holy Spirit that was talking to us. That's got to be the settling factor. And that's what Paul's trying to say. He recognized the voice that, that was there. So let's go on. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, in, in verse 15. But get up and stand on your feet. For I appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of things that you have seen, uh, and of things in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, so, when you read Paul's his, his summation of his encounter you realize, what did he say? He said, the Lord said that I will appear to you. And if you remember, Paul was called an apostle. And the only way that he could be an apostle of Christ was they had to personally see Jesus. And Jesus appeared to Paul. He says, I'm going to appear to you he says, and, and, and uh, witness of things that you have seen and of the things in which I will appear to you. So he saw Jesus. Jesus came and shared some things with him. And, and, and he's sharing that here's what I'm going to do. I am going, I'm sending you out to the Gentiles. And you've got to understand, they're going to persecute you. But I'm going to rescue you from them. Why? Because I'm sending you to help open the, their eyes from the darkness so that they can see the light. And, and when, when we read these things, again, good stories, but this is exactly the same thing that Christ is doing with us. He's telling us, you need to go help people see the light to bring them out of the darkness. And, and how do you do that? Again, you tell them your testimony. You, you know, now, you think about it for a minute. Some people say, well, my testimony is not as great as, as other people. Uh, you, you know, mine, I, I, you know, I got saved at the age of 10. You, you know, and somebody will say, so what trouble could you get into before the age of 10? Where I live plenty. Okay, but did I, you know, do a, a lot of bad things? No, sometimes we, we kind of embellish some things, you, you know. But you think about it. Um, when did you? I was 13. 13, okay. I we'll say around 11. Okay. <coughs> 12. 
church all my life. Okay. And, and so, so when did you come to know the Lord? Pardon? When did you come to know the Lord, though? Uh, in the 80s. In the 80s. Okay. So that was 30-some years ago. Okay. So in your 40s? I'm 40. No, no, no. What, it was, no, you're not 40. You're, you're 70-something, right? I'm 80. 80. Okay. So it was in your, in your 40s. Okay. When I first met you. Yeah, but when was that? 2009. Okay. So, so you've been saved since 2009. Mm -hmm. And Sheila? Okay. All right. And Bob? 91, 92. 91, 92. When I was 12 years old, which would have been 1967. Okay. Around the 70s or 80s? And Jim? Goes back when I was in the service. My uncle was a Baptist preacher. And he was in, I forget what, Santa Barbara, somewhere around that area, California. <laughs> and he was pretty strict. Mm -hmm. But he got me back in the church. And I got in the service, got away from it. And then that brought me back to this church when <coughs> I was here. Mm -hmm. So I've been back 27 years now. Okay. So many in, in, in early ages. Okay. So, so when, you, when you talk about saying, okay, well, this is what happened to me before I got saved, there really wasn't a whole lot. 10, 11, 12, I've heard a lot of 10. Yeah. Many adults who was a Chet. Chet. Yeah. And, and so, so it's like, okay, I really didn't do anything, you, you know. But then you start talking about some that did as an adult, you, you know, that maybe uh, they, you know, we, we had a, oh man, I can't, can't remember the guy's name. It, it was uh, Frank and uh, Viola. Viola, yeah. Uh, when we were, that lived in the trailer up on uh, Oxford Germantown Road right there at the top of the hill. And he was in the 70s. You know, now he played in the bars and, and, and everything. So he could tell you some of those stories. But you've got other people, you know, who were alcoholics, others that were drug addicts. You've got some people that actually have been in prison, that probably have killed somebody, had done some, you know, some, some stuff. So they can recount to you really what was going on. This, this is where Paul's coming from. Th this was my life before I met Christ. Now, after I met Christ, I'm, I'm telling you what happened and, 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 and what occurs. And, and that's what he's trying to tell us. You, you know, that, hey, even though it may have been 10, 11, 12, we didn't have to do a whole, whole lot of things. But most of the time, what we probably, almost every one of us would probably come to a point of saying, did we always live for the Lord? Or were there periods of time in our life when we kind of walked away? And we can say, okay, no, I didn't do this before I got saved, but I can tell you about some things that happened after I got saved. But that still doesn't uh, void our, our salvation. It's still saved. Okay, but what Paul is, is talking about is that here is what happened before I got saved. And here's what the Lord has done for me. Here, here, was, my, here was my conversion experience. He's got his testimony of, of, of what's going on and, and what's happening. And, and sometimes we need to recall that. So... So he's saying, you know, he's recalling this. Now, what, and then what he begins to start talking about is, okay, here's what the Lord said to me. Here's what he's, at, here's what, you know, he, he's asking me to do. And, and look at what he, he said to him. He says, I will rescue, uh, I will rescue you from the people, from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes, that they may turn from the darkness to the light, and, and from the power of, of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin, and, not, and, and a share among those who are sanctified. So, 
do me a favor and, and go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verses four through six. And what did he say to the to the church at Corinth? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we preach for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of Christ, of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Okay. All right. So, so when you're sitting there and you're talking to a lost person <coughs> and you're trying to share the Bible with them, <coughs> how much do they understand? No? Not too much. Not too much. Why not? Why don't they? Satan is blind of the mind. Yeah. They're, they're blinded. They're, they're, in, they're in darkness. And, and um, when, or earlier, uh, when Diane and I first got married, we went to, uh, we were stationed in Maryland. And, and uh, there in, uh, along the uh, 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 Blue Ridge Mountains that, that follow, you know, from West Virginia on down in, into North Carolina and, and, and stuff, uh, you would find a lot of caves, caverns. And, and so, in the, uh, especially uh, in the Shenandoah Valley area. And so we would, we would go into a lot of these caves. Now, in some of these caves were actually um, uh, life. For instance, uh, in, in one of them, I think it's Luray Caverns uh, in Virginia. You, you come out of uh, there and, and you walk down into this huge, like, room that, that's there. And on both sides of the, walk, of the walkway are, are these ponds where the water it comes in, you know, from uh, from the outside and, and stays in there. And uh, there's a, a bunch of catfish that are in those ponds. Okay. Now, in the first generation of catfish that was in there, they could see. But as they were in the darkness... Eventually, as they began to reproduce, they started getting acclimated to their environment. And now every generation of catfish that is in there are blind. And this is what happens when he's talking about people when they get into the darkness. After a while, if there's no light in that darkness, they become blinded. They can't see. Even when, you know, you're talking about going out in the woods at night. You know, well, if there's no, if there is no stars out and it's nothing but clouds and there's no artificial light in the woods, it's like, you're starting to see a lot of things in, in, in your imagination. You know, there's this, there, there's this shadow, and, and the next thing you know, you're imagining the shadow is moving. But if, if that, that would continue on and on, and there would be no light, eventually what would end up happening is you would go blind. And, and that's what Paul, Jesus talking about, you know, bringing them out of the blind, showing them and taking them out of the blindness into the light. Because what's happened is, people that are in the world, if they don't see the light, they will continue to stay in the darkness 
and are eventually blinded. And they're blinded to the truth. They can't see the truth because they're so accustomed to allowing Satan. And, and, and this, is, this is what Paul was saying. Paul was saying that, that he, made, he, he made me in my ministry to help open the, the closed eyes. And that's what he, he's asking us to do. You, you know, are, are we going to do it to everybody? No. But do we stop? No. We, we, we've got to learn that, okay, yes, something happened, and we've got to share that. We, we can't keep it. Because if we just keep it and we don't share it, then what we're doing is we're allowing the people who are in the darkness to stay in the darkness. Because in our life, it is the light, you know, that we're supposed, we're supposed to be sharing. Okay, uh, First Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 9 alludes to, to, to this fact and basically turning them from the darkness. It, you know, we, um, we were talking about it, you know, when you're out there, you know, and it's getting dark, and, and so Johnny's got to come out there with a flashlight or some kind of light, you, you know, to be able to, to say, OK, how do how do I know to get out of where to go out of the woods? It, you know, it, it's like. Um, uh, if, if you're on a ship, you know, there's danger all around in the ports. And, and so what they do is they, they will have a, a, a lighthouse out there with a beacon saying, hey, hold it. You don't want to come over here. You, you know, there's dangers uh, of, of running aground. It's shallow water. You know, you need to stay out there. I'll, I'll try to shine the light so you can navigate through, you know, through the darkness. And, and that's what Christ was saying to Peter or Paul is that you are here, and, and what I need you to do is I need you to let me shine my light through you to help these people navigate from the darkness <clears throat> and, and be able, you know, be able to do them. And, and then the, the other aspect of it, he, he says, <coughs> not only may they turn from darkness to light, and look at this, and from the power of Satan... Uh, and this is back in, in, in Acts chapter 26 in, in uh, verse number uh, 18. Not only from the light, uh, from the darkness to the light, but also from the power of Satan to God. So if I share my conversion experience, I share my testimony, and I begin to start talking to them about what God has done in, in, in my life, how he's changed me what he's done, then I'm trying, then, then God's saying, I'm going to work through you to bring them from the darkness to the light and bring them out of the bondage and power of Satan, bringing them into the freedom of God. And he says, this is, this is what, this is what I, I, I want you to do. This is what I want you to share is what he's saying. And so when, when, he's, when we start telling people these things, there's some things that we, when we begin to start sharing our testimony and we start trying to lead them from the darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, you, you've got to tell them, what's the benefits here? Why, you, you know, because again, the, the Bible is very plain, and, and we need to be honest with people, where it says that, that there is joy in, in sin for a season. You, you know, the church for the longest time has told people, oh, if you go out here and sin, you won't have any fun. And they go out and they have fun. 
And guess what? Hey, you lied to me. So if you lied to me about that, what else are you lying to me about? We need to tell people the truth. And the truth is, there may be joy for a season. But there's going to come a time when the season's going to change. And when it does, that joy that you had there is only temporary. What we need to tell people is that there's some things here that you receive. Number one is forgiveness. And you you think about it for a minute. A lot of people say, okay, so what do I need forgiven for? Well, why did Jesus go to the cross? Because of our rebellion. We rebelled against God. And the judgment for that is hell. But when you receive Christ, you get forgiveness. It's like you went to before the judge, and the judge says, here is all the things that you're accused of. And you're saying, you're right. How do you plead? I plead guilty. Okay, what's my punishment? Well, let me say this to you. I'm giving you a free pardon. I am pardoning you from everything that is on the slate. It's wiped away. And you think about it. I mean, think about it when um, you've done something to someone or someone has done something to you and you go to them and you say, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this. I was wrong. How easy is it for you sometimes to forgive that person? Depends on what they did, really. Huh? Depends on what they did, really. Okay, so there are some times that it's really difficult to forgive people, right? People hold a grudge for a long time. Uh huh. There's some families, years, years, thirty years. But Christ or God is giving us true forgiveness, total forgiveness, and that's what we need to explain to people. This isn't like you and I. This is God that's given us this total forgiveness. Not only has He given us that, we we now become His child, His children. And in this world, as a parent, if you've got anything when you die, what happens to it? Um, it goes to your kin. Yeah, the, the inheritance goes to your 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 uh, your kin. You know, hopefully, hopefully it, it doesn't all go to the state. You, you know, but for the most part, it, it goes to your kin. And, and what he's saying is this: he, he he says that they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me, and not not Paul, but in Christ. So when we get saved, we share in this inheritance. And and the good part about it is we don't have to wait for God to die to get it. Because if we did, we never get it. Because he ain't going to die. And so under Jewish custom, you could go to the father before he died and ask for your inheritance. Okay? And so you could enjoy the inheritance while he was still living. Well, guess what we're going to do? We're going to enjoy our inheritance. 
And, and who are they? They are sanctified. Those who are sanctified or set apart. And how were they set apart? By faith in me. And this is Christ talking. So how are we set apart? By our faith in Christ. Okay? It's what he's trying to share with us. Okay? And so, so we end up, you know, having that. And so, once I, I share my testimony about here's, what, who, here's who or what I was before Christ, here's what happened when I came to know Christ. These are the promises that He gave me. And then the third thing is, now who am I now? I'm, I'm a child of Christ. Now, am, now the difference is, every once in a while, I'm, I'm going to mess up. Okay? But I'm trying, through Christ, to be like Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We're trying to be Christ-like. And, and so that's where you begin uh, to share with them. These are the things that occur. These are the things that happen. Okay. Now, uh, let's finish. Let's finish up a little bit, uh, starting at verse number nine. Now, look. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, to those in Jerusalem, and to all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles. So, so. What's he doing? Christ says, I, I need you to go uh, to, to Jerusalem, uh, you, you know, Galilee, and to the other most parts of Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. And, and, and Paul said, that's what I did. Like the Great Commission. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, I, I did this. That what? That they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, look at what he says, for this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. <laughs> why, why were they doing this? He's, he's saying, you, you know, what, 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 isn't that what God told him to do? <laughs> Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to I want you to go to Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And he says, and I did exactly what Jesus told me to do. And yet the Jews in the temple were trying to kill me for doing what he told me to do. But look at what he said. But since I obtained help that comes from God to this day, I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. He says, listen, I want you to know something. I was not disobedient to what God asked me to do. And so today, I'm standing here and I testify to you of the same thing that Moses stood up and told you guys. He said, you know, uh, from what the prophets and Moses said would happen. He said, all of the prophets that have been standing in this place and telling you what was going to happen, I was testifying to, to you because this is what he shared with me. This is what he told me. And now... So, you, you want to kill me and you want to persecute me? Then why didn't you kill Moses and persecute the prophets? I'm only doing what they did. I haven't been disobedient. I've been faithful to the cause. And he says, and I'm reaffirming today my commitment. 
I'm standing before you and I'm not changing. And sometimes, think about it. When you're sitting there and you're talking to someone about Jesus, and it gets a little bit rough. Do you back off? Or do you stand firm? What we're supposed to do is stand firm. But sometimes people will back away. Well, I don't want to offend them. May I tell you something? You probably already offended them. <laughs> so just go for the gusto and stand firm. I'm not backing away. You know, and, and this is what this is what Paul was was talking about. Now, here's what you need to understand, though, and that is this: when you stand there and you talk to someone about Christ and share with them about Christ. Don't you try to convert them. Don't you try to save them. Give them your testimony. Share your story. And let God do the rest of it. Because let me say this to you. If you can talk someone into salvation, it probably didn't happen. I hear people all the time, they'll talk about, um, I got saved when so-and-so was preaching. And now so-and-so is no longer preaching. Does that mean my salvation is no good? No, my salvation... No, it doesn't mean your salvation isn't any good because that person's preaching didn't save me. It was the Word of God that saved me. He used them as a vessel just as He uses us as the vessel when we're sharing our testimony. It isn't our testimony that's saving the people. It's the Holy Spirit that is drawing in the words that God is using through us to draw them to Him. And this is what Paul was trying to get across to them. You know, you're saying all these things about me, and, and uh, hey, I didn't do anything. So, let me finish up with this and, and, and watch the rest of the story. So, he's talking before uh, King Agrippa. As he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud, in a loud voice. Okay, and, and Festus was one of the guys that was there in the court. Okay, probably thinking, look at what, look at what he said to Paul. He says, "You're out of your mind, Paul." <laughs> mind says, too, "Too much study is driving you mad." <laughs> you, you, you've been in the book too long. <laughs> you have lost all, all sense of reality. You, you know, and here's what Paul says. Paul, Paul says, listen, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. Hey, Festus, you're telling me that I'm crazy? Talk to King Agrippa. <laughs> he knows. He knows that, these say, that what I'm saying to him is true. It, it is to him I'm actually speaking boldly. For I'm not convinced that any of these things escape his notice, since this was not done in a corner. We didn't hide anything. He knew what was going on. We, we weren't doing this in secret. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And Paul says, I know you do. I know you believe. 
Then Agrippa said to Paul, are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? Here's what he says. I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I, except for these chains. Because he was standing there in chains. And he said, I wished that everyone in here right now that's hearing what I'm saying would be like me, except for these chains. Understanding that I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ, and I wish they would. But I would not wish these chains on them. So the king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up and when they talked with each other, and they said, this man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. <clears throat> What's that sound like? Jesus. Yeah, Pilate, after he listened to all the testimony that everybody had given, and he goes to the Jews and says, you know, what do you want me to do with this, with this man? And they say, we want you to crucify him. And remember, he came back and he said, hey, I can't find anything that, that he's done. Why, why do you want to crucify this man? Why do you want to put him to death? He didn't do anything wrong. And then remember what he did? He went over to the bowl of water. And, and he washed his hands. And he said to the Jewish people, his blood is on your hands, not mine. I wanted to turn him loose. But no, you all want him to die. So Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. And Paul's saying, no, uh -uh. no, I'm appealing to Caesar. I'm not taking the easy road out. I'm doing exactly what it was that you wanted me to do. And, and, and you, you realize, if you read the rest of the book of Acts from chapter 27 on, you realize that he did, selling from Rome, uh, or, or sell, you know, selling from, for Rome when they went out, as we talked about today, and they, they got shipwrecked. And yet, Paul told him, said, hey, guys, don't worry. None of y'all are going to lose your life. God's going to take care of us. And, and remember, they, they got out there, and I think that was on the island where Paul got bit by the snake. And the snake that he got bit by was a poisonous snake, and they all thought he was going to die. And, and lo and behold, he didn't die. And they're thinking, okay, God has saved us from the shipwreck. We're still alive. This guy got bit by the snake, and he's still alive. This God that he's talking about, he, there's something about him. We might want to really start thinking about some things. And then they take him on into Rome, and then what, what happens? He starts con converting the whole battalion so much that they had to take and get everybody out of there <laughs> because Paul, everybody who was chained to Paul was being converted into Christianity. And, and what happened? It was because of Paul's chains and, and Paul appealing to Caesar that you, st you started seeing Christianity start moving into the Roman Empire and, and going into all different, <coughs> all different locations. But they said this guy could have been released if he had just appealed to Caesar. No, it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the plan. God didn't want him appealing to Caesar. And this is where I go back, where Paul knows exactly what he's talking about in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 28, where he says that all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Hey, I'll appeal to Caesar. 
because God's got a plan. Even though I've been chained, even though I'm shipwrecked, even though I'm going to die in Rome, it's all going to be okay. Because God's going to use that for his good. And that's what we need to understand. The testimonies that we have, the sharing of our conversion experience, as we begin to tell people, there may be some imperfections in our life. And we share those things with people. Why? Because maybe they might be at that spot where you were. And now they understand. Hold on a minute. And what you're telling them is, listen, don't you understand that if God can do this for me, He can do it for you? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing. If He can save this person who was like this, then He can save this person (coughs) and this person. And that's all Paul was trying to say to him. Because Paul said, you know, he came to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. I'm the worst. And Paul admitted, look at what he said he did. <laughs> they, they know what I did. I came to persecute those who, who, who were talking about this Jesus of Nazarene. I wanted to get rid of him. But look what happened. He ended up giving my life for it. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at pastorchuck at calvarybaptistmiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30, with our morning worship following at 10.45. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, You're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, You're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.